CSIRO uh, in Canberra in uh, the agriculture flagship. Brief introduction on him, uh, he's a breeder, so master in uh, uh, plant breeding from the University of Queensland, a PhD in Raleigh, uh, North Carolina State University. And then he's uh, here on a grant from the Academy of Science of Australia to visit Ikrizat, and then from here he will be moving up to, uh, to Ludhiana uh, for uh, Punjab. Uh, State Agricultural University. So uh, today Greg is going to talk to us about uh, I mean the work I've been doing for uh, water limited environment at, uh, on wheat and basically trade development and phenotyping uh, for, uh, for crop improvement of wheat in, uh, in water limited environment. So Greg, that uh, floor is yours. Uh, if any of you would be interested to meet Greg in those two days which have not been contacted before, that's also your, your, your chance at the end of the seminar, if you want. Thank you. Thanks, Vincent. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, as a student in agriculture, University of Queensland, we were we uh, learned a lot about Igrasat, uh, John Monteith, and, and some of the other brilliant uh, science that was being undertaken here in Icrasat and uh, when I was given the opportunity of travelling anywhere in the world on a National Academy Fellowship I couldn't resist the opportunity to, to finally come and visit with um, with uh, Vincent and his team who are doing some amazing work I must say in the area of vapor pressure and uh, targeting performance under woodland conditions. So thank you Vincent for accepting me and uh, a wonderful uh, meeting with Vincent and his team this morning and just learning a bit more about some of the great work being done here. So as Vincent said, I, I work in Canberra, I work on um, as a breeder, a linking physiology with commercial breeding around traits targeting improved water productivity. I work with a pretty amazing team of physiologists, geneticists, breeders and, uh, and also some modelling expertise. And I guess our focus has been on moving some of these complex traits, these complex genetics which haven't been effectively used in Australia or in many other places globally for improving productivity under the, the holy grail of performance, that is wood limited performance. And so I'm going to just talk a little bit about some of the work we have been doing and give you some sense as to the, the, uh, the opportunities. So I like to think of myself as, a, uh, as, as part of this continuum, uh, extending from very much basic research, upstream research. This is a bit of a funnel, I guess. It's a funnel that reflects the nature and the type and the time frame of science as we see it in Australia and probably in many parts of the world. Um, it reflects the capacity and the investment uh, around some of our science in agricultural systems. Um, and it, it, I guess it highlights the disconnect that we see in delivering some of these wonderful technologies through into application, finally to breeders and to growers. And I think despite the fact we do have this wonderful science, the lack of uh, engagement, the lack of interconnection reflects the people that sit in this space. We have people in the molecular uh, systems biology, um, GM areas with amazing science, but there's no or little capacity for translation unless they work through physiologists or physiologists working closely with um, quantitative geneticists, germplasm people and linking to breeders. So I always think of this connect and disconnect the trait delivery as really reflecting the fact that we tend to work in isolation until we can actually start working together and working in teams or working in, in skill sets as I'm seeing here with Vincent and his team. If we really start seeing or realising the investment that we're, that we're putting into some of these wonderful sciences and having them deliver towards this major problem we have around 2050 in delivering global food security. So the reason I say there's a disconnect is because um, in, in my area anyway, the genetics area, many of the questions that the breeders, the, uh, the, the appliers of our science, their technology, are asking questions of us and of the germplasm of the traits which are very different to the questions being asked by the, the more basic research is upstream. So questions around trait value and are the traits relevant? What is the value proposition? What is the value of the trait? Are there trades off? Are there trade-offs? 
can I scale from single cells, single plants, pots to the field? And the important one is what do I give up in adopting your trait, your germplasm, your genes in order to move my breeding program along? What do I give up? Selection. How do I phenotype? Is it quick, cheap and reliable? What's the correlation of the phenotype to genotype? Are these traits genetically complex? Are there major genes of large effect that I can use? Are there good link markers? How repeatable are these effects? Are they repeatable from one genetic background to another? Are they robust? And issues around correlated response. And finally, um, and it's an issue, issue we're grappling with in Australia in a big way, in making genetic progress into the future, we need to rely as much on our genetics as we rely on the interaction of our genetics with our farming systems. So how do we get the, boat, the, the most out of, out of developing this synergy? By understanding how our gene or our trait fits into our farming system. So I work in a group which builds traits, puts them in adaptive backgrounds and moves them to commercial breeding programs and we've released varieties on the basis of this. The model we use is we moved away from drought resistance, so in focusing on water productivity, we're focusing more on water use efficiency where grain yields a function of water use. This translation of water to, to, um, to biomass through water use efficiency and then how much of this biomass is converted to grain via harvest index. And we focus on three areas, or two main areas. Um, this effectively evaporation, uh, the, the ratio of transpiration, evaporation, evapotranspiration. So this is the amount of water that's lost from the soil surface. So by, by building wheat crops that uh, develop more rapidly, are we able to reduce soil water loss, this precious water? Or the amount of dry matter produced per unit of water transpired, can we improve water, water use efficiency through improvements in transpiration efficiency? Theoretical maximum in Australia for water use efficiency in wheat is around 22 kilos per millimetre per hectare. This graph here summarises some, some uh, shy data from across the country which highlights water use efficiency currently in Australia is around one quarter to one half that level. So this is agronomic water use efficiency. It incorporates genetic water use efficiency and farmer related water use efficiency. But gives us incredible capacity to move to the theoretical maximum of 22 kilos. In doing so, we effectively can boost our yields as a nation from current levels of around two tonnes per hectare to three, three and a half tonnes per hectare for an average uh, annual cycle. So real capacity to increase water use efficiency in our systems. We live in a country where the crop is stored, uh, is grown almost rely reliably, entirely on rainfall. There's no irrigation of wheat. The wheat is sown in this yellow zone here, the wheat belt. It's around um, 10 million hectares nationally per year. In the west, crop is sown in April, May, and the crop then grown in very little stored moisture, but grown on current in-season rainfall. As we move from the west to the east, we see less reliance on in-season rainfall and more reliance on stored moisture. We start moving into the east and the north, we're seeing less in-season rainfall, crop being sown April, May, and grow reliance on stored summer moisture. So in a national program like the one I'm engaged with in Canberra, we need to breed for improved water productivity, we need to improve for a wide range of environment types and traits which contribute to improved performance across the country. So the question begs, there are many traits that are out there that have shown the potential in the literature and in our hands to improve water productivity and water use efficiency. Greater early vigour, better emergence, or vigorous early growth, modifying the, the phases of pre and post amphesis water use, so modifying development. Reduction in, in wasteful tillers, transpiration efficiency, Leaf characters like, like leaf waxiness or leaf rolling and new root architectures. We also have traits like 
the capacity to accumulate and remobilise stored stem carbohydrates. But the question begs, which traits where? How are these traits inherited and how are they to be delivered? And probably most important to the breeders who only have limited in, uh, money and limited capacity to grow all of our traits. How should we prioritise the different traits? So in a national initiative, we've, uh, I guess, led a call towards developing of a new facility, the Managed Environment Facility. These are facilities across Australia which um, are located throughout the wheat belt where we have incredible capacity to monitor and manage the nature of the seas in terms of rain, in terms of water. So these are very dry areas, reliably dry, where we can manage irrigation and soil water. We can use these very large rain shelters and then we can track crop water use through, through new high throughput phenotyping tools and other, other tool, uh, inexpensive tools for characterising our sites. The sites are located in the eastern wheat belt at Narrabri, southern Australia at Yanko, and the western wheat belt at Meriden. They're sites which are quite large. They're, they're well characterised. This is an EM38 survey of, of soil conductivity for one of the sites. This is done every year. This is around four hectares and the, the, the MEF is rotated um, with break crops and, and appropriate um, fallow and legumes in a one in four year rotation. To try and minimise the build up of disease, to try and reduce the influence of subsoil constraints that would limit our capacity to take up soil water. We want to minimise constraints to growth so we can really understand the value of our different traits. We reduce diseases through uh, break crops like canola. And we're working uh, largely in the use of near isogenic lines and tails. So when we, when we have new traits that come out of um, a genetics program or a physiology program, usually on the basis of a large population, you've heard of mapping populations, this is typical of a mapping population. This is a, a Gaussian distribution for trait value. And we take the, 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 the lowest expression of a trait, and the highest expression of a trait, we take these sister lines, we call them tails, the low selected and high selected group. There might be 10 lines, 10 low selected lines. This could be for early vigor, and 10 high selected lines for early vigor, for a potential population of 300. So for a, a limited amount of space, we can effectively grow high versus low selections across multiple populations for multiple traits side by side. It's an incredible resource, an incredible efficient way to screen populations, uh, pop, uh, populations and traits while minimising the contribution of background. So by going for many lines in these tails, we're basically removing some of the potential confounding with background. We're averaging out across the background and focusing on trait expression. So these are the traits that we have been working with in the MEF, the Managed Environment Facilities, where we've been looking at trait value and trying to prioritise traits for breeding programs. Campy temperature, development, these are the, the, the numbers of backgrounds and the lines in the tails. Early vigour, grain fertility, grain size and screenings, ear morphology, reduced tillering, uh, stay green or leaf rolling, stem carbohydrates and transpiration efficiency. Around 400 lines assessing, 400, 400 lines, which gives us the capacity to prioritise and compare these different traits within and across multiple backgrounds. This is a, uh, a summary, I guess, a box plot summary, just showing the range, the mean and the range in yields for the first four years of the managed environment facility. M for Meriden, N for Narrabri, Y for Yanko, 10, 11, 12 and 13, irrigated and rain fed. Just giving you some idea of the range of environment types which we're sampling, our capacity to really understand the value of the different traits. And then for 2014, as an example, this is a by-plot which just summarises how, for, for different traits, the different sites are ranking genotypes. So for grain yield, we've got Meriden, irrigated rain-fed, Yanko, 
and Narrabri irrigated and rain fed. So clustering together, just to reflect those site similarities, but just to highlight that in sampling these three MEFs, we are picking up a wide range of responses, diverse responses um, representative of the Australian wheat belt. For grain yield, harvest index, grain number and grain weight. So very effective, I guess, in, in using these disparate sites and combinations of irrigation to, to really drive uh, genotypic adaptation and, and line ranking for the different traits. And most importantly, breeders will not take up your germplasm, they will not take up your traits or your genes unless it's in something that they're comfortable with. If they're going to be crossing into some new material with a new trait that you think is going to save the world, if on average that background is poor, it's going to be very hard for them to recover high yield potential, disease, quality, all the other things that make a variety whilst maintaining your trait. So we put a lot of effort in backcrossing our traits into elite commercial backgrounds. And this just, I guess, summarises um, the, the uh, comparison of our a, a range of commercial uh, lines with the main commercial lines with that for the, um, the mean of a range of our trait containing lines for, for a range of scenarios. It also just highlights too that relative to the commercial lines, we're actually, we, we often identify material tested with the breeders that out yield current variety. So we're delivering material that they think is of value, is, is reasonable agronomically. So this is uh, just some of the sort of trade information just to highlight just how different some of the germplasm is. This is a early ground cover assessment. Um, this is the range in some of the CSIRO material at Narrabri and Yanko, and just highlights how diverse our material is relative to the very best commercial wheats. So we're seeing material there with almost twice the ground cover of our commercial varieties at Narrabri and Yanko. In terms of campy temperature, we've got material here which is uh, significantly cooler, we believe extracting more late water than the very best of our commercial wheats at Narrabri and Yanko. In terms of stem carbohydrates, material with greater capacity to accumulate and remobilize stem carbohydrates for, for hot, hot dry finishes relative again to the best of our commercial wheats. So the material is relevant. Oh, this is my, um, it's my my heartfelt slide, it just uh, just summarises for the physiologists here, just the, it's, it's a biplot or PCR I guess, which just shows um, for 2014, for all the lines across all the sites and treatments, just the fact that grain yield is largely driven by grain number, harvest index, we see a reasonable strong correlation between anthesis dry matter, spike number, but not with seed weight. So the next two slides are probably the most, two most important slides I've put up in any meeting in 25 years as a scientist. It summarises for five years of research across the managed environment facilities, trait value. So what it is, is it's just summarising for Meriden, Narrabri and Yanko, what is the value of the trait for yield in high versus low expression for a given trait. So for canopy temperature, selection here has been for cooler canopies because these reflect increased water later in the season. So we see at Meriden, Narrabri and Yanko up to a 10% yield advantage in selection for cooler canopies relative to warmer canopies. For carbon isotope discrimination, uh, this is now over eight, eight backgrounds, we see less benefit at Meriden which is largely a, an in-season rainfall environment, but we see significant benefit at, at, uh, at Yanko, which is a more of a stored moisture environment. So, camp, so carbon, carbon isotope discrimination, which is a measure of transpiration efficiency, of value at Yanko, but less so at Meriden. Stem carbohydrates, seeing very little benefit of increased stem carbohydrates um, at Meriden and Narrabri, but some benefit at Yanko. Ear morphology, benefit in selection for altered ear types, uh, benefit in terms of leaf waxiness, so the capacity to maintain uh, leaf area through waxy leaves is 
of reasonable benefit across all three managed environments. Leaf rolling, which is a measure of stay green, uh, of significant benefit. So selection for high leaf rolling relative to low leaf rolling, benefit across all three MEF. Similarly for early vigour, selection for more rapid ground cover and more rapid leaf area development early in the season of significant value across all three MEF, but selection for reduced tillering, reduction in tiller number, generally of negative value across the three MEF. So in summarising this, to a breeder, the four traits that you would target, and the germplasm is available to the breeders, is being used by the breeders, cooler canopies, waxier leaves, capacity for leaf rolling, and greater early vigour, so more rapid campy development. Reduced tillering, no. A real cost in terms of performance, particularly as growers are going to wider rows with restricting tiller number. So probably not a very useful trait. Presence of awns, very, very small effect. Probably um, not a real benefit. Stem carbohydrates is a real cost. And carbon isotope discrimination, depending on where you are, whether this is going to be a useful trait, trait worth pursuing. So just talk a bit about some of our trait delivery work, and I'll talk about cooler canopies and greater early leaf area development. Um, just want to highlight that much of the work I'm going to talk about reflects the, the research we're undertaking around high throughput phenotyping, and I guess integration of some of these new tools in terms of uh, our breeding screening. And just, just, to, just to remind us that um, the sorts of phenotyping that we do uh, very much around scale is a dynamic feature of the trait. Canopy temperature is a trait that we measure over the space of seconds out of a plane. Canopy height will measure at anthesis and at maturity. The crop yields at the end of the season. So I work in a group that has a strong focus on phenomics. And I guess the capacity for high through phenotyping. And the scale here is anywhere from uh, a, a largely robotic or, or machine in the field to a tower, to a, a cropotron, to a, a growth cabinet, up to a plane or a blimp. We use a range of tools which were pretty exciting and, 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 com and, and novel three or four years ago, but becoming a little more routine, a little more affordable now. Firm imaging, uh, LIDAR, chlorophyll fluorescence, hyperspec, and they're deployed at scales from a, from a growth cabinet through to uh, the field in a range, of, a range of guises. We're having considerable success in the monitoring of soil water through the use of RG crop systems, where these are, these are static thermo images, uh, sorry, infrared thermometers, which basically track temperature through a plot throughout the season and, and, and do this around timing of, of irrigation events. And just to wanted to highlight for some of our um, cooler canopy lines, so these are now neurogenic lines side by side, you can just see over a period of five days leading up to an irrigation event how some of these lines are, are maintaining cooler canopies relative to their warmer neurogenic sisters throughout the season. So blue is cooler, red's warmer. So some reasonable success there, and certainly um, successful relative to our very best commercial wheat in terms of their capacity to take up, or maintain um, turga and transpiration later in the season. We do a lot of work on uh, large-scale phenotyping in, in mapping uh, regions for cooler canopies. We moved from the use of handheld infrared thermometers, aerial, aerial during campy temperature in the field in a large scale breeding trial, would take three people an hour. And over that time, that you get changes in VPD, changes in wind. As a result, even with the very best experimental designs, heritabilities were around 10%. So less than 10% of the information that we got from these handheld thermometers was reflecting the genetic signal. In moving to a helicopter or a plane-mounted Everest thermometer, where we could fly over a very large mapping trial, this is um, 
this is around uh, 2,500 plots. This takes around five seconds to fly over. Heritability increases sixfold, 60 to 70 percent. So we're moving up to 70 percent of the total observed variation reflecting the underlying genetics. So confidence in what we're seeing reflecting that noise, uh, minimum, a reduction in the noise to signal ratio. So huge improvement in the confidence. It's also cheaper. It's also quicker to, to uh, undertake um, the use of a plane mounted Everest thermometer. In the ME, and these are all, this is all being done in the managed environment facilities. Uh, we also, as part of the MEFs, we include data loggers to um, track soil moisture and just to highlight the value of these. Now again, this is a, a pair of lines, so a little hard to see. This is now um, three depths where we have a near isogenic pair for campy temperature. Um, and what we're seeing is the, uh, the, the one there in blue, which is the cool one, capacity to get at uh, moisture deeper into the profile. So using the infrared thermometry, uh, thermal imaging, coupled with this capacity for soil water sensing, you get a much better handle understanding as to the physiology underlying some of the trait, trait value work we're doing. Second part, trait delivery we're going to focus on another one of these important traits we've worked on, and that's around greater early theory development. And the reason for this, in Australia, as much as 50% of the, of the water that falls as rain evaporates away. When, when your annual rainfall is only 350 millimetres, this is a significant cost to the grower. So using barley as a model, we've, we've uh, tried to modify wheat so that it's more vigorous early in the season when vapour pressure deficits are low. The exchange of water for CO2 is more efficient. But in doing so, also just covering the ground better. So this slide just shows two lines side by side, one with rapid early growth, one with slow early growth. And just to highlight in this more vigorous uh, plot here, we get less soil evaporation and more water available for plant transpiration for use in, in photosynthesis. Compared to this poor one over here where there's much more water loss through soil evaporation, which leaves less water for transpiration. Some of the, some of the earliest work agronomic work highlighted the value of this saved water. This is some work from David Hall in West Australia where for a given genotype he modified or manipulated early vigour through increased nutrients. So Dave here's got a high nutrient treatment and a low nutrient treatment. This is, these, these are on these very large plots, a so very large scale. You can see with the high nutrient treatment we've got a, almost a twofold increase in the leaf area index early in the season. This translated in the same water use for the same for the two treatments, but for the more vigorous crop we had less water lost through evaporation, which meant there was more water made available for transpiration. In turn, biomass was higher, we had higher grain yields. And David has repeated this, I haven't got all the data, at lower yield levels, and we're seeing exactly the same trend, where you have a large portion of your water as in-season water particularly early in the season, protection of this water is absolutely critical. So this is an agronomic example. How do we manipulate or modify wheat to make it more vigorous when wheat is incredibly conservative? So using barley as our model, we compared, we tried to understand what it was that was making barley and triticale much more vigorous. We found that barley has this capacity to maintain much larger leaves, develop much larger leaves by having a larger embryo and also a thinner leaf. So for the same amount of carbon, you can spread your leaf over a wider area. So we spent a lot of time looking throughout the world. We screened around 10,000 wheats from around the world, looking for wheats that have a larger embryo and or thinner leaves to try and bring in new diversity into our commercial wheat breeding program for greater early vigour. We found a number of interesting sources globally. So out of China, India, Israel, Canada, 
Mexico, um, other places since then. We've identified around 30 wheats from around the world which are unrelated through pedigree. So they're very vigorous, but likely to be vigorous for different reasons genetically compared to the Australian miserably low vigor uh, jants here. And because these wheats were unrelated through pedigree, were we able to bring the different genes together in some way? With 28 or 30 genotypes, you can imagine it's hard accumulating all these favorable genes for, for greater early vigor from different sources. So we've used a recurrent selection program, um, not dissimilar to a program programs used in maize and other outcrossing species, where you intercross all your lines, select the very best, intercross these, select the very best, and you do this over time until you get something which is significantly more significantly better for the trait under selection than what you had initially. You can just see the, the, the distribution is getting narrower because we're starting to fix and accumulate favorable alleles in our recurrent selection. Um, we use um, a pretty novel method, uh, SO1 or S12 recurrent selection, which gives us some help genetically to, to, to uh, fix favorable, favorable effects early. And because leaf area is a very difficult thing to measure, we've identified a surrogate for leaf area, which is simply leaf width. So this slide just shows for three parameters or three, three measures of early leaf area development, mean leaf width, mean leaf length, numbers of leaves. Heritability for mean leaf width is, is very high. So much greater confidence in what we're seeing reflects the underlying genotype compared to mean leaf length and numbers of leaves where there's less confidence, I guess, in what we're seeing reflecting the underlying genotype. The genetic correlation for leaf width and leaf area is stronger for mean leaf width than it is for mean leaf length. And together, heritability and the additive uh, correlation for leaf area, we see a realized genetic gain leaf area of around 90%. So what we're saying is that in selecting for mean leaf width in a, in a segregating population, we're 92% as efficient as selecting for leaf area itself, but it's much easier, it's much quicker. This is where our recurrent selection program occurs next to, uh, next to our lab. These are all separate segregating populations through our, recur through our recurrent selection program. We screen around 6,000 progeny a cycle. We basically uh, remove anything that has a narrow leaf. We then replicate this the following year, progeny test, and those lines which are the most vigorous have the widest leaf then go into the next round of intercrossing and our, our next level of recurrent selection. Uh, some data um, from a student, uh, uh, Liang Zhang, last year, where we looked at seed from each of our recurrent selection cycles grown together in the same glass house and harvested and then grown and assessed in the same trays. This was just published in JXBOT um, a month ago and just showed uh, for four sowings, including a low uh, reduced soil nitrogen sowing, the linear increase in leaf width with, selection for recurrent, with recurrent selection for leaf size. So very linear increases in leaf width because the phenotype was so heritable. In selecting, with, in, in, in selecting for leaf width, we saw an increase in embryo width, measure of embryo size. We saw an increase in specific leaf area in selecting for leaf width. There was a small, a small change, the scales a bit uh, off-putting here, a small change in the time to seedling emergence in, in screening for wider leaves but an increase in the rate of leaf elongation. So in selecting for wider leaves, we manipulate embryo size, specific leaf area, and rate of leaf elongation. And just to show you how some of this material looks, this is uh, the, a, a current vigorous commercial wheat variety. This was one of the cycle zero parents, and this is where we're up to. In selecting for wider leaves for wheat of the same seed size, we're getting a near doubling in leaf area. So fairly successful. 
want to highlight that despite our efforts to increase above ground biomass, we've also been quite effective in improving below ground biomass. And I guess it's not surprising in having a, a larger shoot, you need this greater demand, need for greater capacity to acquire nutrients from water to feed that hungry machine. So just showing you uh, from uh, Liang's work, just differences in a commercial wheat and a cycle six line in terms of root vigor, larger number of seminal roots, larger numbers of, of uh, branch roots. And then this is uh, some work from R.A. Poulter where he characterized some of this material for root length and root biomass. These are three commercial wheats. This is one of the original uh, cycle zero donors. And these are some of the lines coming out of the, uh, the recurrent selection program. So much greater root biomass, much greater root length. In turn, we're seeing with this material greater capacity for nutrient uh, use efficiency. So Peter Ryan tested some of this material against some of the very best phosphorus use efficient wheats and found that these high vigor wheats were able to acquire and maintain a greater biomass under P limiting conditions. So they're accessing more phosphorus and they're also maintaining higher uh, leaf, leaf phosphorus concentrations. And Iro Poulter in some of this material looking at nitrogen uptake in commercial wheats versus some of the advanced figure selections. Again, this work towards larger shoots is contributing to a, to a, a, a correlated response in, in larger root systems. And some of this material has made it through to some of our, our weed ecologists. This is uh, some work of um, Gergi Gill's group in Adelaide. This is a near isogenic pair right from the background um, yet P. It's got some cycle three vigor uh, parentage. Uh, that's yet P there, that's yet P with vigor grown in the field. And what I wrote, um, what Gurdjieff showed is this is now two commercial wheats, three of our recurrent selection vigor lines at 200 plants per square meter and 400 plants per square meter with rye grass. So a major weed in southern Australia. And what he showed was that our vigorous wheats are very much able to um, assist in controlling uh, weed biomass and weed growth, particularly at higher plant densities. Certainly much better than we can achieve with our very best commercial wheats. So while we don't necessarily think our vigorous wheats will completely outdo the need for herbicides, it gives the growers a bit more help in terms of maintaining their herbicide management, particularly in Australia where herbicide resistance is a real issue. How do we screen for vigor in the field? Again, this is now the integration of new technologies. Uh, this, is a, this is now a, a modification of our Finimobile machine. So this is a machine that carries a LiDAR, which allows us to get fractional height, a uh, fractional ground cover, canopy height, biomass, and leaf greenness. A green seeker for NDVI. And then we've got um, a high-res RGB camera for plant counts and visual assessments, all hooked up through a, a computer, which uh, feeds data through Wi-Fi to, uh, uh, to a router in the field. This is fully automated, sorry, fully automated, it, uh, it's a, a, a mechanical wheel, and this goes up and down the field, being guided by somebody. We can do around um, eight hectares a day, capturing a whole range of useful data using this $40,000 piece of equipment. Uh, this is now looking at ground cover, RGB camera versus the use of LiDAR. You can see with RGB that there's quite a lot of shading uh, in getting at ground cover with RGB compared to LiDAR. We, we, we get uh, good estimates of plant height with LiDAR. So this is now manual measured height with a stick versus LiDAR integrated measures of campy height. And we're now getting more comfortable in being able to predict biomass using LiDAR um, than with actual uh, destructive, destructive measurements. And the problem with anthesis or any sort of biomass cut is that it's very, very difficult to get good estimates of biomass. Heritabilities are low because there's a lot of sampling variation, even in larger quadrats. When you go to, light, when you go to a LiDAR-based system, your plot's no longer a quadrat of this size. It's now a 10 square meter plot. As a result, we're seeing heritabilities now for biomass of around 70%.
this wonderful very rapidly into these profiles which can then be analysed further for getting at light extinction, um, other important measures important in, in RUE. Uh, just finishing up, just wanted to talk briefly about some of our genetics work. Uh, I've heard a bit about NAN um, here and, and the value of NAN in allelic mining and uh, allelic testing. We use um, multi-parent multi -parent based mapping. This is just demonstrate we work on wheat which is a, it's a huge polyploid, a lot of repetitive uh, DNA. Um, it's around, I, I think it's 18 times the size of the human genome. So it's an awful beast to do genetics with. We've developed some mapping populations which reflect diversity from across the globe. And using uh, the power of meiosis, I guess, and recombination, have been able to bring together all these different sources of diversity into these large populations where we have incredible, incredible recombination and capacity for uh, breakdown into very, very small discrete bins of incredible value for mapping. So with a, with a biparental, we get these bins of average size, two centimorgans. We go to a, go to a four parent, to an eight parent uh, uh, bin, uh, sorry, population. The reduction in bin size is, is massive. So it's incredibly powerful for mapping work, but then going, uh, moving towards uh, candidate genes. So I talked about vigor being really important. Well, a major driver of vigor in our environments is coleoptile length. The coleoptile is the shoot that goes from the seed to the soil surface. So it basically moves the shoot to the soil surface. And uh, in Australia, where moisture may be very deep in the soil, growers rely on a long coleoptile in order to, to bury the seed where the moisture is. Current semi-dwarf wheats produce coleoptiles of around five centimetres. They're very, very small. Under control conditions, we get them up to around eight centimetres. So this is a coleoptile of the commercial variety Jantz. This is the coleoptile of uh, one of our new uh, breeding lines, around 130 millimetres. You can sow these lines at um, 12 centimetres and they emerge. So dissecting uh, coleoptile length for the use of the magic population, see the FOI population, just want to highlight that with good phenotyping, and good mapping, the right mapping populations. We can move from the old biparental means of mapping here in a, in a, a population, so going for coleoptile length, where we get four to five QTL for coleoptile length. But in the magic population, which includes one of these parents, we've actually moved from five QTL to 17 QTL. And some of these are highlighted here. But importantly, these QTL map directly to varieties in the Australian wheat breeding program. So we've identified new alleles, new opportunities for selection for coleoptile length. We have the capacity to, to clone and move these genes immediately into commercial breeding programs. And similarly for early growth. Just to highlight that our coleoptile screening is done in controlled environments and using our populations, our phenotyping, we have a strong association genetically for coleoptile length at different temperatures and it's linked very closely to shoot length at different temperatures. And importantly, variation in coleoptile length, the shoot that takes you from the seed to the soil surface, is linked very closely genetically to above ground biomass and leaf area. The shoot is effectively, sorry, the coleoptile is effectively a modified shoot. But no matter how much work we do on modifying coleoptile length, the best genetics, the best phenotyping, we've really struggled to move longer coleoptile and early vigor into our commercial breeding programs. Well, I guess we've been focusing on single traits, but really breeding is about bringing to multiple traits. I guess I haven't, I guess this has not been made any clearer than my work on vigor, where we've acknowledged that selection or reduced height using the Green Revolution dwarfing genes. The genes that reduce plant height, Punjab, Pakistan, and around the world, Norman Borlaug's um, amazing effort, these genes, while reducing height, also reduce cell size throughout the plant to reduce coleoptile length and leaf size. This is some lovely work from Mark Sorrell's group where 
there's an incredibly linear relationship between cell size and increasing frequency of the green revolution dwarfing genes. So these green revolution dwarfing genes that reduce height also significantly reduce cell size to reduce coleoptile length. So we've moved our attention away from RHT1 and RHT2 green revolution dwarfing genes to alternative dwarfing genes. And these have come out of the, uh, the um, these are new genes that have been identified as, as uh, coming out of the Cold War, some of the mutation breeding work out of Russia, uh, Eastern Europe, China, and uh, been assessing these alternative dwarfing genes. And I guess it's just important to highlight that while these alternative dwarfing genes reduce plant height to the same extent of our green revolution dwarfing genes, they have minimal effect on coleoptile length and shoot size. And uh, my next visit after here will be to Ludhiana, where some of this material is being used, being crossed in, in the Indian um, National Wheat Breeding Program to try and improve establishment here in, in India. And so these are now new semi-dwarfs being bred here in India based on the syro, um, sort of our syro germplasm. And these are being sown at 15 centimetres. So typically we can't sow below 5 centimetres. We're getting wheats to emerge from 15 centimetres. This is in Ludhiana, and this is now an indoor. So quite a success in, in moving traits from the top of the funnel to the breeders, and hopefully before too long to Indian growers. So in summary, I guess I can't see the world. I, I, I just see incredible value in crop physiology and our capacity to use crop physiology to identify new traits a new source of diversity to maintain linear gain into the future in our breeding programs. But we need to link crop physiology, as we do molecular biology, any of the theologies that we work in, to commercial breeding programs by asking a number of important questions. Are the traits relevant to the challenges being addressed? How do we prioritise one trait over another? I gave an example around trait value. Are there cheap, reliable, and population-friendly high-throughput phenotyping methods? Many of these traits are complex genetically. If they're not complex genetically, if they're controlled by major genes, can the phenotype be replaced with a breeder useful linked marker in selection? And can that marker be, moved, be used across a, a range of populations? Can we deliver adaptive germplasm containing key traits for crossing and validation? Are our pets, our, are our favourites, ready to go into breeding programs for use? And then finally, moving from, from traits singly, are there crop gene models capable of assessing trait by trait combinations? So I guess we're learning more as we move, as we move into single traits. We often need another trait to help that, that trait along and buy the value of trait by trait combinations. So with that, I'll um, finish off. And if you have any questions, happy to answer. Thank you very much, Greg. But the, the floor is open to questions. Yeah, so very nice uh, talk. Thank you. So I have two questions. Uh, one about the phenotype. When you use the planes and the helicopters for phenotyping, so what's the resolution of your detection? I mean, how much difference you can detect, for example, in your canopy temperature? Good question. Um, so at 200 meters, we can resolve down to um, I think it's 15 by 15 square centimeters, 15 by 15 centimeters. So around 400 pixels in a 10 square meter plot. So um, that's around 200, 250 meters. As we come lower, we get greater resolution, but we see less of the field. So it's a bit of a trade-off between going higher and seeing more of the field in one pass, but seeing less of the plot. But We've done some power tests and, and realistically the value in going higher and getting at a resolution of 15 by 15 is more than enough in wheat to get a good estimate of that plot, the, the value of that plot, the temperature of that plot. And the second question is about your lines, the, the vigorous lines. You mentioned they are, uh, you know, they, they produce high biomass on low nitrogen and uh, low phosphorus. So did you actually measure the yield of these lines in low nitrogen, low phosphorus? No, no, we haven't. No, the materials um, 
very ungainly. It's uh, it's been selected. It's come out of some some fairly wild sources of diversity globally, and so our role is we've, we've ignored agronomic type in our recurrent selection. We focused only on seedling screens, um, and we've done that because in the first two cycles we, we we went and undertook some top crossing to move the traits into some elite backgrounds to see how quickly we could recover agronomic type in a commercial background and vigor. And it was very easy. So our thought was let's not worry about agronomic type. Let's just worry about getting the genes for vigor as quickly as we could and as reliably as we could. So we didn't have to go back and repeat it. And so now we're at cycle cycle six. Sorry, cycle three, the weeds the weeds work. We, we, we did some top crossing to commercial wheats then and it was very successful. We're now at cycle six and we're undergoing that uh, job now. We're, we're top crossing the vigor along with the alternative dwarfing genes into our five commercial wheat backgrounds for delivery to commercial breeding programs. And it's a, it's a simple top crossing, pro, back crossing program. We cross um, the alternative dwarfing gene into a commercial parent. The F1 is then crossed into the vigor source. Um, because using prediction, we're getting hundreds of bigger genes, and then straight into the back cross to the commercial straight into the commercial parent, and we're recovering material which is well, up to seventy five percent commercial, with many of the traits we want for agronomic release, but while maintaining vigor and the alternative dwarfing gene. So yeah, so to answer your question, we haven't tested this material um, other than the, the seedling screen. It's, it's a, a high priority for us once we have agronomic material to move that into these nutrient screens in the field. Thank you. It's a roundabout way of answering that question, so I'm sorry. Nice presentation indeed. Uh, you mentioned uh, something uh, about cooler canopies, right? Uh, so I'm just wondering whether it is because of the albedo of the crop or it is because of high transpiration uh, efficiency or high transpiration rate of uh, the crop? There, there was a slide there where we, and it wasn't for all the, the cool county wheats, there was a, there's two lines that we have con, uh, ice lines contrasting for temperature and the, the cooler wheats are getting at uh, soil moisture or partitioning moisture later into the season. So whether they do that because of effects on stomatal control, um, it's not albedo, there doesn't appear to be anything unusual about the canopy, um, there's just something unusual about about the way that water is being conserved through the season, it's something we need to follow up on. Because if it is, um, if it has anything to do with the loss of water from the canopy, then I think it will be very difficult to uh, simultaneously select for leaf rolling. These two traits actually don't go together. Selecting uh, for, you know, um, cooler canopies, which are mediated by, say, high rate of transpiration, and also uh, leaf rolling, because usually leaf rolling takes place when temperatures Go yeah, absolutely. No, leaf rolling is a trait, um, as a backup trait, I guess. Yeah, so so, so reliably, um, I, I don't think yield, I mean, realistically, uh, yield is a function of many traits. And so for us, it's about having trait building, varying traits, and leaf rolling is a trait there for extreme finishes, no question. If you have exhausted your moisture, are you able to maintain leaf area into a drying, a drying finish in some way? that um, allows you to recover in case you do get rain. And um, Xavier Sarai just finished, or finished his PhD a few years ago on leaf rolling. And under extreme terminal droughts, independent of canopy temperature, um, the trait was worth about 10% in a one-ton environment, purely because the rolling occurred very early in the morning, sorry, mid-morning. The leaves were tightly rolled and then by around four o'clock they unrolled again. So there was some photosynthesis. There's accumulation of water through the night. And then early in the morning, they un and, and they, they were continued photosynthesis early in the, the following morning, but were rolled again by 10 o'clock. So it, it's, a, it's a, I guess, an avoidant, I'm not sure the right word is, avoidance or escape trait only for very, very uh, tough finishes. So, we, which are not atypical of our, our environments. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I guess I'm not a big believer in selection for yield um, in the long term because we're going to run out of diversity. And if you're any good at measuring a trait, you're going to fix those alleles very quickly. And so how do you get a new diversity so you can maintain uh, average effective gene substitution with breeding? You've got to replace a bad allele with a good allele. 
So to maintain linear gain, linear genetic gain under a quantitative genetic model, you need to have new alleles coming in. So where's our new diversity coming in? Do we, do we just bring in random diversity and hopefully there's something good there? Or do we target traits that are going to give us something of value under, through our knowledge of the environment? And my guess is that I'd rather do something that we know is a value of the environment and can contribute to yield than bringing random diversity in. So you're right, yield does work quite well. Um, yield does not work well when you have no diversity for yield. And so the traits really are at bringing new diversity in. The question then becomes one, yield will give you benefit with lots of diversity, but the, the heritability for yield is quite low in woodland environments. The correlation of, of line performance from one environment to the next in our environments is, is very low. Massive genotype by year by location effects. So if you're relying on yield when you can't reliably predict yield from one site or year to the next, you better have a trait that is reliably predicted from one site one year to the next and is associated with yield than to rely on yield, yield alone. My third reason for going for this trait is you cannot select for yield in the, in the, in the next three row, but you can select for, for leaf bigger in their three rows. So you can enrich a population very early for traits associated with improved performance, improved yield. They're actually having to measure yield. So that's another benefit for it. But it's a good question. Yeah, very much water uses, um, but also this partitioning, I guess, of water use up to and after anthesis. So it's, it's getting at a, a more important signal that well, I don't have any skill to do, but Vincent does in, in I guess, in, 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 I guess, monitoring and conserving water use um, to that part of the season when there's not a lot of water around, around, around some marble control or around, around, around root factors which control water use. So, yeah, so it's less water use efficiency, more water use. Yes. Yeah. Just they're using that water, I guess, more carefully, moving through through, and and so they still properly get water users. They have water, whereas the the warm canopy weeds have exhausted their water. Yeah, Greg, um, you, you showed one of your sites had high spatial variability, the, one of the MEF sites. Are you trying to use that spatial, spatial variability or are you just trying to block it out like traditional breeding has, has tried to do to control that spatial variability? So this is this slide here. Yeah. Um, Sorry, if I, if this one here? Oh, the M38, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's why the M38 was taken. Yeah, we're just trying to manage, we're trying to move into blocks which are much more uniform and avoiding the, those hot spots in the field, yeah. Is there any point you can actually start to use that spatial vari variability and get into geostatistics or? Spatial statistics. I think it's down the track a fair bit when you just have a limited number of, of lines that you're trying to. Look yeah, at. we haven't here. This is really around minimising the the confounding across the block. But um, at other sites where there are issues, we'll actually run the N38 across every plot and fit that as a linear covariate, particularly if we think there are issues around uh, conductivity. It has. It's, it's worked well. There was. Uh, I mean, it's, it was an unusual example, but one site we had, um, we, fit a, we fit a full AR1 covariance model and we had a ability of 60% for yield. We fitted the, um, fit that model and fitted the M38 as a simple linear factor and it went to 85, 87%. So it was invaluable. Invaluable because of what did the ability, but also what it added to the, the already complex analysis precision analysis, which is the spatial analysis. So, yeah, and so simple and easy to do. 
what we are exploring now is using it through the season in terms of understanding woody, differential water use and how connectivity changes there may be useful predictors of biomass and, and uptake. So still a bit of work to go there though. Any last question? Thanks for your time everybody. Well, um, about conductivity, you know, I mean, uh, there are two sides of the coin. Um, so, if you increase conductivity of the soil, you are also exposing your soil moisture to potential uh, evapor transpiration losses, right? So, how do you actually do this balancing act? I, I, again, it's it, it's uh, I'm not expert in that area, so I, I don't really know. There's been some discussion around around how we might do that. I think some of the some of the complexity you've addressed part of our our discussion. Yeah, yeah, you're talking about. Question. Hydraulic conductivity, and he's talking about electrical conductivity. Yeah. So two different things. Thanks. Great. Thanks to Greg for the great seminar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me.